Hello, Collegiate Wesley. I miss you more than you can know. I am honored and proud to be asked to remember our history together on this 20th anniversary of the passage of the Reconciling Statement. To help with my memories of this occasion, I grabbed my copy of our most recent Collegiate Wesley history written about eight years ago. Imagine my surprise to find that there was not a chapter about our passage of the Reconciling Statement. Nothing at all about the four years that we'd spent working to get it adopted. How could that be? How could we just forget to include it? So I was left to my own best recollection. In the mid-1990s, there started to be more audible rumblings against those paragraphs in the United Methodist Book of Discipline that had been there since 1972 that said that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. And so one July day in 1996, Reverend Cindy McCalmont invited me to lunch at the downtown deli. She wanted specifically to talk about what we might do to bring that conversation to collegiate. Now, I have to admit that if Cindy would have let me, I would have drugged my heels. We had been in Ames barely two years. We were experiencing a nice, smooth relationship with Collegiate Wesley. Why would I want to bring up something so disruptive? But she persisted. And so on that summer and fall, we uh, worked with a small group of members on what would, it would mean for Collegiate to become a reconciling congregation. In November, the Administrative Council formally authorized the process and turned that small group into a task force. Now, I need to acknowledge that we decided not to include the name of the Wesley Foundation in the decision. Though we knew Iowa State students involved with us would be supportive and involved in the conversation, we were receiving about $200,000 in annual funding from the Iowa Annual Conference back then, and that funding would be threatened by conservatives in the conference if the campus ministry was named in making such a dynamic statement. In fact, the conference rules said that explicitly. At that time, there were two reconciling congregations in Iowa, both with under 100 members. Collegiate was more than 10 times that size, not counting participants in the campus ministry. Well, over the next three and a half years, all kinds of things were done. We used the official United Methodist study book. We had an ecumenical Bible study with eight other progressive congregations in Ames. Our United Methodist women and church school classes and other small groups initiated book studies, presentations, and discussions. And we had a series of in-home dialogue sessions over the course of a year with about 200 church members participating. During that time, we became more educated and articulate in the ways that biblical references to homosexuality cannot be taken as definitive for Christian teaching because they're rooted in the culture of an ancient society that wasn't very scientific. We learned that those few scriptures do not reflect the will of God as taught by Jesus. Rather, we learned that there are ways to understand scripture that faithfully affirm same-sex relationships that are covenantal, committed, and monogamous. During that time, informed by our journey together, the task force developed a 300-word statement of reconciliation, the last few lines of which, once adopted, have been regularly printed in newsletters and bulletins. Well, as we were moving toward a vote on the statement, we were stopped in our tracks for what would turn out to be 16 months. The Judicial Council, which is like the Supreme Court of the United Methodist Church, ruled that no congregation could adopt the identifying label of an unofficial group or movement. In other words, a congregation could not call itself a reconciling congregation. Not wanting to be in violation of church law, we didn't know how to proceed. After much discussion, the Ad Council decided that the Statement of Reconciliation could still be passed, but that collegiate 
would not formally align with the National Reconciling Ministries Network, nor call ourselves a Reconciling Congregation with capital R, capital C. As a side note, a couple of years later, the Ad Council decided that you don't have to declare yourself to be a Reconciling Congregation in order to be a Reconciling Congregation. The statement had already done that work. And so it was determined that Collegiate and Wesley Foundation could start paying membership fees to the Reconciling Ministries Network and be listed as Reconciling Ministries on their site. As we approached the charge conference vote, we were worried about the possible loss of members. The fact is we had already lost some. All of that was painful, but such is the cost of doing the right thing. There were those who were convinced that in uh, the long run, we would be able to more than offset any loss through the gain of new members who would appreciate our stance. Finally, there was a charge conference on October 8th, 2000. Fortunately, we had a district superintendent in Dave Shogren who allowed the conference charge conference to be called for the subversive purpose of considering a reconciling statement. There were people who wondered if they could vote in absentia, but we determined that as with any other charge conference I've been a part of, the decision would be limited to collegiate Wesley members who would be in attendance throughout the meeting, a two and a half hour event, including times of prayer, teaching, discussion, discernment, and at the end, a vote. At the end of the afternoon, 114 of the 121 votes cast were in favor of the statement for an approval of 94% of those present and voting. Well, those of you who have heard me preach will know that as always, I am pushing my time limit. But I have three brief reflections and uh, recollections of the passage on this, of this statement 20 years ago. First, I want you to know what a leader Collegiate Wesley has been on LGBTQ inclusion for the annual conference since the year 2000. I don't think that there was a year when someone I didn't know came up to me and said, thank you for what Collegiate Wesley is doing. It gives me hope because in my congregation, I and those who feel like I do could never express our support for LGBTQ persons. It's good to know that you're there saying what needs to be said. And I want the generation of young adults and those who are coming of age today to know that 20 years ago, what this congregation did was courageous. It was groundbreaking, it was risky, it was defiant, and it was prophetic. It may seem today like a statement like this is the uh, bare minimum that should be expected. But even in the United Methodist Church in 2020, the statement stands against the status quo and the official position of the denomination. The statement has broken ground. It has taken down walls. It has cracked open the church. And it has made movement possible into what will hopefully be a fully inclusive and reconciling future. And finally, I think I have an idea about how we could have made such a big mistake, that glaring omission of leaving the story of this statement and its passage out of our book of written history. I think it's because the statement is really who Collegiate Wesley is. By the time the history was written down, the perils of its passage and the pain of losing members, and the years and years of painstaking and tedious wordsmithing were all past. And Collegiate Wesley had just gone back to the business of being the place God's community is intended to be, where love, grace, and justice for all people is embodied and lived out. The reconciling statement is just who you are. Thanks be to God. Well, that's about it. And that's enough, isn't it? Stay safe, Collegiate Wesley.
stay healthy, wear a mask, and I promise that when this pandemic is over, or over enough, and you are back to meeting in person, Susan and I will be back among you some Sunday morning. Mm -hmm.